Oh, did I hit something? Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Committee of the Whole meeting for September 25th. A um, couple of housekeeping announcements. First of all, um, the agendas that were available at the uh, door on the way in um, have two items that were added yesterday. So if somebody has an older um, agenda, uh, items 10 and 11 might be missing, but uh, they are on the uh, official agendas for today. Uh, also, if you would please uh, silence your cell phones as we begin so that we uh, can proceed without interruption, and I'm doing that even as we speak. Um, we have uh, 11 agenda items today. Uh, one of them is a presentation, um, and I've been asked to pull uh, items 2, 3, 5, 7, 8, 9, and 11. Um, so uh, I would ask for maybe a motion on the other items. Move consent on the remaining items. All right, there's a consent motion. Is there seconded by Olson? Uh, any discussion? So folks, uh, for any of you in the audience, what this means is that uh, items one, four, six, and 10 will be passed uh, with the recommendations that came from staff. Um, is there anybody here who would like any of those items individually discussed? If so, let me know now and we'll pull them. All right, seeing no one, uh, call the roll. Wolski? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Pittner? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Street? Yes. Okay, that takes us to item, that motion carries, it takes us to item number two, which is the SWIFT Action uh, C Levy Repair Bank Stabilization Final Payment. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Wolski? Second. Seconded by uh, Strait. Discussion? Alderman Wolski, you pulled this. What I you? did. President Chancellor, thank you. A uh, brief comment related to this. I'm going to support this motion. Um, the uh, Maybe it's an isolated example. Maybe it's uh, something that just caught my attention as I was driving by. But I feel like as I've noticed these areas around town, um, the, the planting of the grass in many cases seems to be being um, more encroached by weeds. Uh, and, and so this is a, an ongoing issue that we've had in the city. Uh, and I bring it up just to, to call attention to it, Dan. Maybe I'm, like I said, maybe I noticed uh, an isolated spot that got my attention. Um, but, but I think what I would hope is that maybe there's a, a review of our contracts to make sure that the ongoing care as these areas come back to fully grown, that, that we're able to either include that in our contracts or uh, account for that in some form because it feels like I think the area that I noticed, it felt like it had been planted and then abandoned and then kind of taken over by weeds. Uh, so I just wanted to share that comment. Public Works Director, you care to comment? Mr. President, Alderman Wolski, yes, when you have summers like this last summer where it's extremely dry, you know, we don't specifically have in there that the contractor has to keep watering it and watering it and watering it. Um, if we did, you would have uh, extremely expensive uh, sodding. Uh, costs on these projects uh, compared to what we're paying now. You know, right now you see it's three to four thousand dollars an acre uh, to do it. If you were to have them continuously water it, you'd probably be paying ten to fifteen thousand dollars an acre for these repairs. So, um, like I said, and, and typically with with plantings, um, we've tried to do some more hydro mulch, uh, which will help decrease the weeds uh, that are going along there, and especially with levees. Um, all of the areas are seeing that. The top of the levees, it's uh, it's difficult to get grass established there. It takes a couple years um, just just because of, uh, like I said, when it's dry years and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, I, I would agree. Uh, yeah, the weeds are, are an issue. We try to get them knocked down as soon as we can and to not damage the fresh grass that is coming up there and ruin the seeding that we have in there. Further? President Johnson, just a brief continuation here. Dan, I appreciate hearing that. I completely appreciate the challenges. Uh, and, and I think this reflects back to a comment I made at maybe one of our uh, early budget workshops or something like that. But I, I think we need to take a really close look at our, our greenscape management practices. Uh, these are areas where I wonder if it wouldn't be appropriate for, for native plantings and species that become uh, a lower cost maintenance alternative long term, probably, a, and I would assume, a higher cost 
upfront uh, establishment of that, but, but then ultimately we get to let it go. Um, so I just wanted to share that comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, any further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, call the roll. Wolski? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Pittner? Yes. Hodgegula? Yes. Straight? Yes. Motion carried. Item number three is the Cities of Service <coughs> Budget Amendment. Is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Wolski. Second. Seconded by Pittner. <coughs> Discussion. Uh, President Alden, Janser. Alden uh, Wolski. Um, question here. It just in, in the, the phrasing of this memo uh, uh, that we have to capitalize these, uh, uh, the purchases for this equipment, um, is this different than the manner in which we capitalize books and media and other things that are uh, at the library, or are we are we charging a rental fee uh, for 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 these products when they're they're checked out? Um, um, anybody want, staff want to comment on that? I don't know if that's uh, library director or finance director. Okay, we got library director is going to help us out. President Janser and Alderman Wolski, I'll try to help out as best as I can, but the tools that are checked out through the tool library are checked out the same way that a book or a DVD or CD would be, and those items are capitalized also. Okay. Further questions for the library director? Thank you very much. Thank you. Further discussion on the uh, motion? Seeing none, we'll vote. Please call the roll. Wolski? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Pittner? Yes. Podrigula? Yes. Straight? Yes. Motion carried. Um, item number five is next. Uh, that is the uh, joint powers agreement with the Minot Park District related to the uh, Discovery Center. Is there a motion? Move approval. Moved by Alderman Olson. Second. Seconded by Straight. Alderman Strait. Uh, discussion? Alderman Wolski. President Janser, I thought uh, since it surfaced in the staff memo, it was appropriate to uh, to call this out for, for a bit of discussion and a little bit of an explanation. But in uh, uh, Ms. Hendershot's memo, uh, their clause three suggests that one of the pieces that needs to be included in the thinking here is that the determination by the city finance director that sufficient funds have been collected upon the city sales tax, tax which adequately fund NAS project and further permit distributions of the $1 million sum for improvements and enhancements to Roosevelt Park Zoo. Um, I, I think as we've been through this budget process, uh, we've identified very clearly that our previous collections were not enough to fund NAS, uh, uh, but this decision was made back in 2017 prior to that, that finance director arriving at that conclusion. Uh, and so, I, you know, this is just an item that I think has caught some discussion around town in terms of priorities and, and I think it's important to keep in line timeline uh, in some of these pieces. So I just wanted to share that comment. Okay, are there any further questions or comments on this item? All right, seeing none, um, we'll proceed with the vote. Uh, call the roll please. Olson? Yes. Pittner? Yes. Hodgegula? Yes. Straight? Yes. Polsky? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Janser? Yes. Motion carried. Um, item number seven then is up next, uh, and that is the uh, eminent domain authorization for the um, CB, CBD, CDBG NDR property acquisition. So moved. Uh, moved by Wolski. Second. Seconded by Olson. Um, discussion? President Janser. Alderman. Uh, uh, Wolski. I had uh, pulled this uh, simply uh, wondering if there was a typo or a correction that needed to be made uh, on looking at the addresses in the memo. Uh, they did not match up with a particular address uh, in our GIS website. So. Okay, Mr. Zakian is going to figure that out with us. Um, President Chancellor Alderman Wolski, yes. The correct address is 10563. I type too fast sometimes. I simply wanted the record to be very clear on this issue as we that one forward. And, and if I may, just for clarification purposes, um, all this is doing is giving us the next step, which is authorization to proceed. That is not to say that if this is approved, 
tonight and advance forward to the council meeting that the next day we will immediately proceed. I've actually had conversations with two of the three property owners and said to them, this just gives us the next step, but there'll still be an opportunity to negotiate this before we go to eminent domain. Okay, city manager. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I just would like to have the motion maker and the second uh, revise the motion to reflect the corrected address uh, so that authorization is uh, legitimate for that property. Thank you. I think I made the motion. I would agree. Okay. And, yes. And uh, Olson. Okay. Yep. President and, Chancellor. And the, the clerk has noted the uh, corrected address. So I, I would just add one following comment, John. I, I appreciate the fact that uh, that you guys are going to continue to work with these property owners to, to see if settlement can be reached prior to having to end, end up in the courts. Uh, we've been through that a couple times recently, and I, I think that served the city well. So I appreciate um, that. President Chancellor Alderman Wolski, along those lines, again, picking up on your collective emphasis on being as transparent as possible, we did add a new layer, which had never been done before, which is uh, last week we sent a letter to each of these three property owners informing them of this next step and giving them the parameters. I, that was why I wanted to reiterate and also to continue to give them the opportunity to come in and negotiate a settled purchase price rather than go to eminent domain. Okay, thank you, Mr. Zakian. Any further discussion about the uh, motion? Seeing none, um, call the roll. Wolski? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Pittner? Yes. Pondragula? Yes. Straight? Yes. Motion carried. Um, item <coughs> number eight is up next, and that is the <coughs> legislative process and priorities. Um, I'm going to call on the city manager to just uh, tee this up um, after we have a motion. Uh, so moved. Moved by Mayor. Second. Second by Alderman Strait. Uh, city manager. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> President. Uh, members of the council, or committee, I should say, uh, I've presented to you in uh, memo format a recommendation for our 2019 legislative process. Uh, it denotes various steps along the way for us to consider and ensure that we meet those timelines so that we can have an effective conversation with our legislative representatives uh, in November. Uh, I would simply ask that you approve the 2019 City of Minot legislative process as identified or alter it to your liking, uh, and also request that all council members uh, begin identifying legislative issues, priorities, and topics so that we can assemble those as a team and begin putting uh, together the white papers that we'd like to share with our legislative uh, representatives. Alderman Wolski. President Janser, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Berry. I agree, greatly appreciate uh, uh, the, the foresight and the work to this point going into to getting this process in place. Um, uh, I, I, and to a specific priority that I just had a conversation about uh, not 20 minutes ago uh, with uh, uh, Jay Schuler, uh, the director of the Department of Commerce. Uh, uh, I think one of the obvious uh, challenges we have in Minot is a worker shortage. We've got very high, uh, or very, excuse me, very low unemployment. And uh, we have, I think, an initiative taking place at the state level and on other levels to maybe reduce or relax the licensing requirements for many professional uh, jobs. Uh, and I think in particular, when we've got a number of people coming into the city from the Air Force Base, from other states who may have licensing in those locations, but it might not align perfectly with North Dakota standards. I think that's a, a, an effort that's being made at the state level that we should get on board and support locally. Um, I would tell you that uh, uh, we have, uh, as Task Force 21, been working this issue as well. There is a uh, uh, North Dakota uh, governor-appointed committee called ND Compass that is also working these issues. Um, and so um, for all these boards and uh, groups that uh, control, um, you know, somebody moving into North Dakota and um, they're a teacher or a, um, a hairdresser or a, a plumber or what, you know, whatever they are. And um, if that if that military spouse, you know, has difficulty being able to pursue their career here, that is a uh, negative from the Department of Defense standpoint, from the Air Force standpoint. So uh, we are we are trying to uh, work on that. There have been uh, some states that have passed um, 
significant legislation at the state level to deal with those issues, uh, Utah and Nebraska being two of them. And so uh, there, is a, there is a pattern for this. We don't have to reinvent the wheel, um, but uh, we have met with uh, some of the local legislators and uh, um, uh, we have two people from Minot serving on ND Compass and um, uh, Senator Burkhart and some of the other folks uh, are going to be trying to work these issues. So um, it, it, it is, it is uh, something that's important and that we need to, to work on as one of the topics. Uh, in this uh, legislative process and priorities. Alderman Potagula. Yeah, I have um, other topics I'll be suggesting, but uh, I just wanted to compliment Tom um, and the other people behind this um, for the process of setting up some timelines, setting up some specific goals and objectives in terms of us being more effective in Bismarck with the legislature. I think that's particularly important because of the financial situation we're in and the water projects. I guess those would be my initial kind of suggestions to look at. Um, but I think the idea of doing this systematically, of getting input from everybody, uh, is an excellent one. And again, long overdue, and I'm really glad to see it happen. Okay, further comments, discussion? Alderman Strait. Thank you, President Chancellor. I guess uh, to follow up on Alderman Padragula's, uh, the, the water initiatives obviously come to mind, but a couple that I'm thinking about of just how we as a body remain informed you know, sometimes I receive text messages from citizens of this is coming out of the Main Street initiative from the governor's office, and uh, I'm clearly thinking about recovery reinvented um, for Mayor Sitma of, you know, something that citizens are looking at us wondering where it's at, what we're doing, and what's coming down from the state level. So it's also a, of how we can be better informed of, of what's happening that might not be on the legislative docket, but there are certainly some some initiatives at work that that would greatly benefit our community and it's how we kind of remain up to speed and i, I guess my my other one that i've been giving a, a lot of thought about partly because my father was bending my ear this morning about the marijuana initiative uh currently at the state level and so uh that's another one that i think regardless of how the voters are going to respond we're going to have to deal with it at some point and I, i'd rather us have the conversations uh as much as possible because at League of Cities, we attended a little bit of an update of what's happening with the medical marijuana piece. We're clearly going to be down the road in the next year with how and where we come online in terms of our, our whatever they call it, distribution center. Um, but it's something I, I think that we need to do a better job of informing ourselves so we can turn around and be ready to, to share with the public because they're going to ask us and I'd rather know than have to reach back out to Tom or Derek later and get a better handle on it. So I guess just for discussion, Mr. Berry, I think that's that's important. So okay. Thank you, sir. Okay, further discussion. Seeing none, uh, please call the roll. Sitma? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Pittner? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Straight? Yes. Molsky? Yes. Okay, motion carried. Um, that takes us to um, item number nine. Uh, ho however, um, I'm going to ask <laughs> that we uh, maybe alter the agenda slightly and um, uh, save that for last, if that if that's okay. Um, and uh, uh, because that's a presentation, and uh, I'd like to deal with items 10 and 11 before we before we do that. So, if we could, um, moving to item number. Uh, uh, 10, which was passed on uh, consent, and then now we're on item 11, which is the reallocation of the first penny of sales tax. Um, is there a motion? So moved. Moved by Alderman Strait. Second. Second by Alderman Wolski. Discussion. Alderman Pittner. Thank you, President Janser. I guess I will. Uh, um, kind of give my thoughts on this, I guess, when looking to the IEDC report, which was attached uh, along with the memo, uh, the, report, the report, maybe more specifically the uh, executive summary of the report, under the key findings, you'll see that uh, the city government needs to initiate a sharp course correction from history of passive reactive role in economic development activities to an active proactive leadership role to overcome a history of stakeholder silos, uh, 
functionality, primarily the result of a historic lack of comprehensive, coordinated, clearly articulated citywide economic development strategy. I quote uh, from the executive summary, I believe that by approving this ordinance change and the reallocation of the first penny, it will allow the city to be more equipped to take a more of a leadership role um, and simply just add another tool to the toolbox of the city as far as economic development. Um, I think to commit anything specifically would maybe be a bit premature, but we will set ourselves up um, for a number of different uh, strategies that may uh, be implemented in the future um, as soon as the, the next coming year. Um, I think that uh, it's a step in the right direction as far as bolstering ourselves and, and trying to enhance our economic development, um, whether it be through studies, whether it be through uh, grant matching of funds, whether it be through um, outside council in, in, in a number of economic uh, areas. I think uh, it's just, it's our responsibility as, as leadership and that's that's only one key finding from the IDC report. There's several that, that suggest that the city take a much more comprehensive and, 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 and a much more intense leadership role in this in this area. So that's, that's why I, I support this memo obviously um, and, and I'm up for, uh, open for any other discussion. Okay, thank you, uh, Alderman Pittner. I guess, uh, you know, from my, uh, from my point of view, um, when we talked about this the other night, um, I had really a couple of concerns. One, one was that um, the amount of money was arbitrary, and the second was that it was um, not designated for a clear and specific purpose. And um, so given that um, uh, this approach uh, provide some flexibility, but it leaves the, the door open to um, what may develop or what may be required in the future. Um, I think this is something that I can live with, so. Further discussion, Alderman Wolski. Yeah, President Janser, uh, I, I agree completely with your thoughts. I appreciate uh, Alderman Pittner uh, kind of revising the, uh, the, this uh, motion and bringing it back in this form as opposed to attached to the budget. I see what we, we're talking about here is the opportunity to create some agility, and uh, I'm gonna support the motion. Further discussion, Alderman Potter-Gula. I wanted to thank Paul for his initiative. I think the first significant initiative since he's been on the council. Um, I had some hesitancy about the timing of that and its tie-in with the budget when it was first brought up, but I think now uh, seeing it in written format with a very nice rationale, I would strongly support it. Um, you know, I think it gives us the flexibility. It lets us leverage uh, some other sources of funding that may be out there from the state, from other organizations, and from private organizations. And I, I think it would give us the wherewithal to, to to be more uh, aggressive, uh, more assertive and aggressive in a positive sense. So I'm really pleased to see this and I would uh, cheerfully support it. Mayor Sidlow. Thank you, President Janser. Uh, to piggyback very briefly here, uh, given the work with the IDC uh, groups, the different working groups uh, that, that will be tasking uh, through the next year and I hope finding some significant progress in the very near future, we don't have exactly what the final answer is, and I think, as has been pointed out, this gives us some latitude when it's, when uh, that time comes to be able to address those expediently. So uh, I applaud Alderman Pittner for this as well, and uh, certainly gives us that ability down the road. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Alderman Street. Uh, thank you, Chairman Janser. I, I agree with everyone, and I, I guess I wanna also point out for all of us that there's still some money remaining in the uh, under the findings or the money that went in to, to pay for the IEDC report, there's still funds left available within that. And uh, I think moving forward, it's gonna be really important for us to, to figure out a way to use those funds that also are uh, the discussion for the community, the benefit of the community of the whole. There's been a, uh, at my visit mine out meeting last week, um, there are some other business owners that are from around town that are you know, they hear the, the bit in the media that is focusing on downtown, but clearly our goal is that everything we're doing is benefiting the community. But I think that we have to always be uh, reiterating that point because sometimes it's lost. And I think in terms of those dollars that are left uh, as we move forward with not just the IDC report, but also uh, I appreciate Alderman Pittner's here today that, that we have to keep that in mind and be able to continue to speak to that as a kind of a unified front so that people aren't believing that we are siloed, so. 
Thank you, sir. President Janser. Mayor Sitma. One follow-up with that uh, in regards to Alderman Strait's comments. Uh, there will be some uh, actionable items coming very soon regarding the city as a whole and economic development and filling a lot of those gaps. And I expect some of those to come out of these work groups and will be addressed very, very soon. So just uh, so that you're aware of that. Very much, very much looking forward to that. Um, any further discussion on this motion? <clears throat> Seeing on call the roll. Straight? Yes. Wolski? Yes. Sitma? Yes. Janser? Yes. Olson? Yes. Pittner? Yes. Padragula? Yes. Motion carried. We have saved the best for last for our meeting today. Uh, we're going to hear from uh, our fire chief, uh, fire department chief, with a uh, update on the fire department. Chief Kelly. President Janser, members of the committee, thank you so much for this opportunity. The Minot Fire Department is made up of 67 dedicated men and women who have developed and now live by our mission statement, trained, maintained, and ready. We are proud of that mission, as well as our visions and our values. Our fire department is experiencing a culture shift over the last few years, but we are excited for our future and using these as our guide. <clears throat> the Minot Fire Department was organized in 1895 with paid on call firefighters. In 1927, the Minot Fire Department became a fully career fire department. The fire department at that time was just that, a fire department. Today, we are so much different and have become more of an all hazards response team. Many events through our nation's history have shaped fire departments from the Great Chicago Fire to the horrific events of September 11th. In 1972, the television show Emergency featuring Johnny Gage brought emergency EMS, fire-based EMS, to a national level. In the 1970s and 80s, fire departments took on more EMS as well as vehicle extrication because of the, the vehicle crashes that were because of our speeds. The first jaws of life were given from the state of North Dakota and provided auto extrication, saving time within that golden hour. The Minot Fire Department began EMS and vehicle rec extrication in 1977, not only for the city of Minot, but for also within a 50 mile radius. In 1995, Oklahoma City bombing rocked our nation to its core using domestic terrorism with hazardous materials. This prompted fire departments to begin preparing for chemical, biological, explosive, radiological, and nuclear events. <clears throat> in the early 2000s, thanks to your support, we took on a greater role within the state as one of four technical level trained, equipped departments for regional response for hazardous materials and structural collapse. F using federal Homeland Security funding, which was provided by the state of North Dakota, the oversight develop the teams, equipment and continuity and training. This opportunity allowed the city of Minot to become better prepared for this emergencies and for our citizens. The city of Minot has an adopted fire code, which is the international fire code. This is used as a guide for our prevention department to ensure safety within our commercial occupancies and daycares. This has been a challenge over the last few years with our extreme growth and development. The fire department has seen a steady increase in call volume over the last few years with our population growth within the city. This slide shows the calls from 2008 to 2017 as it compares to the growth in our population. So how do our calls compare to other communities of our size? The pie chart on the left is the number of calls and percentage of calls by type for the year of 2017 for the city of Minot. The pie chart on the right is the national averages for communities of populations similar size to Minot. Looking at just the pie chart and the colors, the sizes are very similar. We are very compared, comparative to other communities in regards to our number of calls that we have in the city of Minot. Diving into our calls further, we utilize the GIS department in the city to plot 10 years of our data for fires. fires are anything from a smoke investigation to a structure fire. 
In 2009, you'll see that we had 381 fire calls, and in 2017, we had 758. So when a fire chief is looking at data and looking at our performance, we look for the Super Bowls. Our Super Bowls are our structure fires and cardiac arrests. So this slide shows our Super Bowls for the last few years from 2008 to 2017. There's a significant spike in 2016 for which I cannot explain. When we look at our data um, for EMS calls, in 2009, we had 1,900 calls, and in 2017, we had 2,182. Central Dispatch utilizes emergency medical dispatching to triage our calls based on pre-established protocols. We looked at our overall data and we respond to approximately 50% of the EMS calls that are reported in the city. We are uh, dispatched to calls of most need that we can make the greatest impact. So within the city, we provide a tiered response comprised of the police department, the fire department, and community ambulance. Our response districts allow us for quickest response to emergencies working to meet the standards that we strive for. These standards have been established through research of those Super Bowls, both structure fires and cardiac arrests. Both require a quickest response for the greatest outcome. As you can see on this slide, with the increase in time before medical intervention, the percentage of survival decreases. The top five emergency medical calls within the city of Minot that we respond to, number one is cardiac, number two, respiratory distress, and on down from there. As you can see from this slide, the increase, the, all of these require medical intervention very quickly for the greatest outcome. Oops. So throughout the city, your firefighters are responding to a multitude of emergencies. Each community has areas that are busy, busier than other areas for a multitude of reasons. Station three district has a significantly lower call volume than stations one and two, and station four is on the rise and on track this year to have a greater number than last year. The couple of different spikes we, we looked at is 2009, there was a significant snowfall, and station two took primarily um, most of the EMS calls during that time. And in 2015, we did a major remodel of Station 2, and we divided the city in half for EMS calls. So Station 1 and 3 took them, and, um, and that's why there's a decrease in Station 2's calls during that time. So in looking at our performance metrics, so the metrics for st structure fires for first arrival, total unit response time for fires is 5 minutes and 20 seconds. We'd like to meet it 90%, not less than 70%. And for the city of Minot, we meet it 66% of the time. So this slide indicates the four minute response time from your fire stations. This is a guiding principle established by ISO and NFPA. When asked the question if this response time is reasonable for the city of Minot, I would go back and ask, what is the expectations of this community? We use NFPA as a guide for best practices, and we strive to provide the best service to our community so that this is why we use this benchmark. The additional one minute and 20 seconds is how long it takes for our firefighters to get dressed and begin responding. The photo on the right indicates the four minute response time for the property that was purchased for station five, and it fills the gap very nicely. You will see in station four's district, the upper level, is primarily farmland at this point, but it does have a nice established route up there that they can get to that area quickly. Our second metrics is what, how it, long it takes to provide an effective fire response for 15 to 19 firefighters at fires. This metrics requires a full response for nine minutes and 20 seconds, 90% of the time, not less than 70. We in the city of Minot meet this standard 50% of the time. Looking at our GIS mapping for the eight minute response time, we believe that it is absolutely unrealistic for us to make, it, make, this, make this metrics 90% of the time. We will strive to meet it at 70%, but our roads and our topography restricts our responses. 
So why does time matter? I know that most of you have seen this graph before. In the perfect world, it's gonna take up to 10 minutes for a, for a fire attack to begin. The quicker the fire is discovered, the report to dispatch, and for us to begin responding, the greater chance of survival and property conservation. During the fire, a chance of death or injury varies greatly if the fire is kept within the room of origin. An NFPA study that studied 2,600 fatalities and 13,000 injuries found that if we got to the, if we kept the fire within the room of origin, 3% there's a chance of injury or death, as opposed to past room of origin, which brings it to 81%. There's an old rule of thumb that a fire doubles in size for every minute that it's left to burn. That may be true in the legacy homes and older homes, but today the makeup of our contents, primarily of plastics and synthetic materials, they burn hotter and faster than ever before. Within the city of Minot, we have found for this metrics, fire contained to the room of origin for 80% of structure fires, we made it 84%. We meet this goal because of an effective and efficient fire force. This diagram shows a model of an initial on-scene operations of a single family home that requires 15 personnel. This model provides the greatest efficiency and safety for initial operations. When a working fire is discovered, a callback of off-duty personnel is conducted immediately to provide additional crews for those that may need rehab or for other emergencies that arise within our community. The recruitment and retention challenges have taken a toll on your fire department. I can't thank you enough for your support of the pay plan and for the benefit package changes as proposed in the 2019 budget. Healthcare and pension have been the top two reasons for personnel leaving as we have done exit interviews on every one of them. This graph shows the number of personnel hired since 1987 as well as the resignations. This graph does not include, not include retirements. We've only included the ones that have left before their retirement date for other employment or opportunities. Working with the Workforce Development Committee, we have diversified our recruitment and retention initiatives and will continue, continue to evaluate them and change as we need to. For the last couple years, we have focused heavily on developing our personnel. I thank you for the ability to have a training officer to assist us in meeting these ever expanding and challenging aspects. Through our succession planning, we knew that 2018 would be a key year within the fire department. Due to retirements this year, we have promoted a new assistant chief, three new battalion chiefs will be appointed, seven captains, including the one that became our training officer, and we've hired a part-time fire marshal. We have heavily invested within our officer development as we knew that the new leaders would need to be prepared to take on their new roles. We have brought in courses from the National Fire Academy, as well as worked with professors from MSU to provide development workshops. This summer, we focused on driver operator program for senior firefighters. We promoted and lost many of our senior firefighters, leaving us with very few people that could drive and operate our specialized apparatus. We conducted a three month boot camp over the summer, focusing on ensuring that they were ready to promote in September. We conducted a recruit academy. Many of you attended the graduation. Thank you for that. We, can, we are conducting another academy starting on October 8th as we hired nine new firefighters on Friday. With it, that many personnel, they need to be trained at a higher level because we can't absorb that many within our operation at once. We've also began requiring pro board certification for our firefighters in both firefighter one and two. The question has arose, is the Minot Fire Department right sized? Our population growth has been steadily on the rise and we have a number of firefighters, but we've increased in 2001, we increased in 2013 and then again in 2016. To drill into this further, is we're gonna look at the number of firefighters per thousand population. We found two studies, both conducted by the NFPA. One study shows that for communities of our size, we should have 1.31 firefighters per thousand. 
The other study, which was conducted and called the U.S. Fire Department Profile for communities the size of Minot, for our region, being the Midwest, we average 1.16 firefighters per thousand. Minot has 0.812 firefighters per thousand population, and you can see by the graph as we conducted our own survey of those within the state and region, Minot comes out on the lower end of the surveyed fire departments. These again are all um, career fire departments. Again, from that profile, we looked to see how we, we rank in four different other areas. For department type, fully career, we're at 52% of the surveyed fire departments within the same population as Minot. And you will see in each category, the city of Minot is comparable in the greatest percentage in the areas of fully career fire departments, 3.4, three to four pumpers, one aerial, and four or more fire stations. Our greatest accomplishment last year was the reclassification to a two for the ISO. Going back in our records, we found the last five surveys, and from 1987 to 2003, we were a four. We dropped to a three in 2013, and we, we uh, became a two in 2017. Our community should be very proud of this protection classification. Compared to the other fire departments within North Dakota, we are one of five to be a class two. And for countrywide, we are one of a little less than 1,500. We should be very proud of that. So what does that mean for savings for our homeowners? As you see on the graph, the class two rating means a significant savings compared to a class 10 rating, which is essentially no fire protection. This illustration shows the different values of the homes and based on the classification, what their property insurance would cost, their homeowner's insurance would cost. One should note that ISO is not used by every insurance provider. This next slide is a graphed version of that previous slide showing the different home values and the decrease in cost of coverage based on the ISO classification. We have been immersed in the budget over the last few months. What is the cost of a Minot Fire Department and how does it compare to the department's other departments in our great state and, with, and within our region. So as you can see from the graph, the Minot Fire Department costs $131 per capita. As illustrated from the graph, we are on the lower side compared to other cities surveyed. Again, these are all career fire departments. So what is the return on investment? We again turn to our metrics. The Minot Fire Department will save at least 95% of the value of property and contents threatened by fire. Last year, we, we saved 97.9% .9 of the value of property and contents threatened by fire. We are very proud of that, and we had some significant fires last year. So what is the cost of being dis displaced? Many times you read in the paper or you see on the news that someone had a fire, but once that initial story is told, we tend to forget about the impact to that homeowner or the tenant. Very similar to those that have been affected by the flood, it may take months or years to recover. So we just surveyed nine owners for, for those that had fires this year. And this is what the real costs were to them. We are thankful that we've had no deaths or injuries of human life we did lose five cats and a ferret this year so far. As you can see from this illustration, the impacts from their losses can go on for months. So what is the future for the Minot Fire Department? We are currently in the process of implementing a new reporting software for better reporting capabilities to allow for more in-depth data analysis. That will be needed in order to complete the last three projects, especially the standard of cover document, that we will dive into our data and allow for data-driven data operational decision-making. We will also be working on collaborating with some of our community partners. Trinity Health staff from Community Ambulance, North Star, and the nursing staff have been meeting with our personnel to discuss ways to work together to provide a le greater level of service to our community. We are also collaborating with Safe Kids, 
which is an organization that focuses on combating and educating on intentional injuries. We are also collaborating to fill training needs, joint equipment purchases, and identifying ways to become more effective. The possibilities are endless, and we look forward to bringing back and bringing you a briefing on the progress that we make moving forward. Finally, we are very excited that next month is Fire Prevention Month, and Fire Prevention Week is October 7th through the 13th. Our theme this year is look, listen, and learn. Be aware, fire can happen anywhere. Next month is an opportunity where we get out into the schools and we educate our students throughout our community on fire safety topics. We are actually kicking off, no pun intended, with the MSU football game on October 6th, where we will be tailgating, a fire truck will be up there visiting with the kids, and we hope to see all of you out there. I'd like to thank you for your time, and is there any questions? Um, Kelly, thank you for a, a lot of information, a good, good report. Um, I would ask if uh, you could maybe send your slide deck out to the council members so that we could look a little bit closer Absolutely. at that as, it, you know, we, as we have time. Um, but um, thank, thank you for all the information and uh, for uh, giving us the report today. Any questions or comments from the uh, council? Alderman Wolski. President Janser, thank you. Uh, Kelly, uh, thank you for going first in this process uh, in terms of these department and director reports. Um, I, I greatly appreciate uh, what we're going to be seeing uh, with this part of our, our monthly agendas. Uh, I do have a few questions for you. I'm going to save them for now. I know a lot of people want to get out of here today for, for Who's Fest, but I'll look forward to the slide presentation and I'll shoot you some, some questions via email. Thank you. City Manager. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, Chief. I just want to thank you as well for going first. Uh, this is something we're trying new and uh, trying to get all the department directors out to speak to the council about all the great things that are going on in their departments. You have set a high bar for the staff and I want to thank you for that. So appreciate all that you've done and your team as well. Thank you. Alderman Potter Gula. I wanted to join the previous two commentators in thanking you, Kelly, for going first and for such an informative presentation. I particularly like the way the information was presented in a very nice, colorful, graphical format. And I also appreciated especially the comparisons um, between what goes on nationally and regionally within our state. I think sometimes um, we're given information that uh, maybe to the technical department person makes a lot of sense, but to us who aren't um, technically skilled in some area of municipal functioning, numbers don't mean much. So I think it's particularly important that we have a sense of perspective and a context for the numbers and the information. Um, the only thing I guess I would like to see in addition to this, and maybe you'll be responding to Josh, is I'd like to kind of see an assessment uh, of you know, what the challenges are. I mean, I think implicit in all of this has been getting the response times down in the western and northern part of the city and trying to get Station 5 funded I know we've put that off because of the budget situation we've been in, but when I look at the numbers you presented, when I look at the maps, the graphical presentation of the data, I, mean, I think that's a significant issue for the community. And in the past on the council, I've pushed you know, very strongly for more resources in the public safety area. I've not done that the past couple of years because of our financial situation. Um, it's just not been realistic. But I think as a community, we really need to take seriously the fact that there are major portions of our community that don't have the fire protection that we'd like to give them and can give the other parts of the community. You know, we talk about giving flood protection to the southern part of town and the eastern part of town. And I, I strongly support that. It worries me. Um, I lose sleep periodically on wondering what's going to happen to those people when the next flood comes. Hopefully it won't be as catastrophic as our previous one. But I think the same logic applies here, is that all of our citizens, except perhaps in the most outlying areas, deserve a uniform level of coverage and protection. Um, so when, when you respond to Josh, I guess I'd ask, add on, I'd ask, get a copy of, of his uh, questions in, in your response, but I guess I'd get, add on to that a question about, you know, what challenges do you see? I mean, from my perspective, I've just articulated those, and I think one of the other things you've said implicitly and explicitly is this notion of having adequate staffing and maintaining career ladders and making sure we don't have as so much turnover. But I'd like to see that a little bit more specific maybe, and I, I know you've talked about plans, and I'm impressed with those. 
but I'd like to see it in, in black and white. And I think part of that, part of the reason I'm asking for that, is more an analysis of the weaknesses and the challenges. Um, because I think it's important that we understand as decision makers, you know, w w what the real picture is. And I think part of our job is to give you the support, you and the other department heads, the support uh, in terms of morale, in terms of resources, in terms of our interest to help you do your job more effectively. And, you know, I think sometimes, there's a, well, sometimes, <laughs> there's always a tendency just about every organization to you know, say how great we are. And, and, and then we are good. We need to recognize our, our good performance. I'm looking at our city manager here because he's done a lot in that respect to remind us of that. Um, but I think we also need a candid assessment of the problem. So as a model, as a, as a template for future presentations, I would also like to see, you know, what are the challenges, an explicit list. And again, I, I, think, I, I think I can read between the lines. But um, both for you and for the future, I'd like to see that. You know, and I don't think there's any problem with, with looking at our shortcomings and, and our weaknesses, but I think we need to be candid because it's so easy to forget about those. And if we forget about those in some areas of our municipal functioning, like police and fire and, and water, um, people can die. Um, so, so I think that's critical that we be informed of that. There's a human tendency, and it's particularly an organizational tendency, not to talk about problems and challenges. And maybe we you know, we want to cross out the word problems and just put challenges. But that's something we need to hear. And again, you've, you've come very close to that. And I think in, in the future, I'd like to kind of go that next step. But but otherwise, I'm, I'm very, very impressed with the presentation. I'm very impressed with the firefighters we have. Um, and I'm looking forward to a, a new, new crop of recruits joining us and the continued momentum toward a much higher level of service been uh, moving toward for years. Uh, and, and when the other departments make their presentations, I'm looking forward to the same kind of um, trajectory, the same kind of progress. So, so thanks very much. Uh, my, my deep appreciation to, to you and your folks and looking forward to more positive reports. Any further? Chief Kelly, thank you again. That has uh, concluded our agenda. And um, with that, we're adjourned. Perfect.